Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a very important meeting, this one, uh, bringing us all together from the science to the regulation and some uh, remarkable scientists. I've got um, Matt and Brian here who uh, we were all pretty much together in the same lab of Lenny Grenti who's also here, so it's a great reunion. And thanks, uh, Zan, for pulling this together with your colleagues. Um, but I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to jump straight into it. I'm going to try to spend about 30 seconds or less per slide to try and give an overview that we can then talk about later and jump in. Uh, so there are some easy, not so easy, uh, and hard problems to solve. The hardest, I think, is what we've just talked about, but um, because I'm a scientist, I'm not going to jump into there. But that would be the hardest, is to try and get the regulatory part of it all sorted. Um, because it drives everything, really. It drives the research, it drives the development, it drives the investment, it drives the insurance payments. Um, so what are the easy? We know this. Uh, surprising uh, how few people do it, but um, I'm out there proselytizing just about every day now uh, what you can do in your lives now uh, if you want to live uh, healthier, if not uh, certainly longer. But what's not so easy? Well, not so, not so easy is trying to figure out what to do if someone cannot jump on a treadmill or cannot miss meals um, or cannot get a standing desk and, and stand up all day or uh, cannot afford a biomarker feedback, which some of us are using now. Essentially, that's taking blood tests and having a computer tell you uh, how out of range you are for your demographic, for your sex, for your age, and how to try and get that back in order. That's coming. That's coming. So there, are, there are biosensors on our arms. There are of course, watches and, and a ring like this that I'm wearing. Um, and that'll all help continue uh, what Richard uh, beautifully showed in his talk, um, the, that trend going upward linearly. But I would say that if we don't do something, those of us in this room and our colleagues, it will not continue that way. It doesn't happen by accident. We have to work as human beings to make that happen. So what's the not so easy? Well, there, there are many pathways to control aging. That's been the breakthrough since 2000, well, actually more like early 1990s, that there are actually genetic pathways that control aging. We, uh, Matt, Brian, and I, and Lenny worked in yeast, um, and those pathways actually have shown to be uh, very important in our bodies as well. And the challenge now is finding molecules, I believe, to, to treat, medicine, uh, treat diseases with medicines. Um, so you can see there's, there's Rapalogs, which um, we'll hear Joan talk about, and Matt. Uh, we've got uh, NAD boosters, which Lenny, I think, will talk about, and I'll talk about a bit. Metformin, which Neil will talk about. Um, and uh, the stacks, I want to give an update on stacks. Stacks are sirtuin activating compounds. First one that got a lot of um, press was resveratrol, but there are others. There's quercetin, which is now uh, proselytized as a uh, senolytic. There's physetin also. Uh, 2104 is a drug that was developed by Sirtris and GlaxoSmithKline. An update on that, uh, I think, is warranted now. Um, there was a, a debate, let's call it, about how these activators work based on an assay that was uh, in vitro. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this now. Um, we've published now an evidence for uh, a mechanism for how these actually work. And you can see here that there's an activation domain in the N-terminus there, that blue thing. And if we mutate an amino acid in that, in that hinge region, uh, we don't get the activation anymore. Um, you can see there is resveratrol and this 1720 and 2104 that went into humans. Um, they look very different than each other and these were the ones on the right, the SRT2104 and SRT1720, were about 1,000 times more potent than resveratrol. You can see there's about 18 to 20 crystal structures up there. So we can now block this motion. Um, as a geneticist, we can just create cells and a mouse that doesn't do this activation step and ask the really important question, in a cell or in an animal, does resveratrol work through this activation step or is it working through AMP kinase or one of the other dozen mechanisms that resveratrol is thought to work through. Um, there were some positive results that was going very well uh, around 2014, 2015. This was some early signs in 40 patients that 2104, uh, when it got on board the patients, was quite effective. It's published in 2015. But now let, let's look at those mice that are mutant for that one amino acid in CERT1. Um, they actually have absolutely no response to resveratrol in an assay for a variety of things. This one I'm showing you is lifespan on a high-fat diet where you want to compare the green line to the red line. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to debate it, but I think this is pretty much proof that, that resveratrol activates CERT1 and provides longevity on a high-fat diet through this mechanism. The other thing that's interesting about this is that the mutant has a phenotype which 
either suggest that we naturally get these activators from our diet and we've evolved to sense the plant world, an idea that we've proposed with Conrad Howitz, but also maybe there's an endogenous activator of sirtuins that, that would explain why this same amino acid is conserved and probably this mechanism uh, in worms, uh, flies, and, uh, and clearly mice. What about NAD boosters? This is um, a hot field. We work on this uh, quite a lot. We've published last year, we had a paper in Cell on, in 2018, um, showing that if you give NMN, which is an NAD booster that raises NAD levels about 50% in a mouse, uh, you can see, hopefully you could see that, I'll play it again, that the, mouse that, the mice that were on NMN for four weeks uh, had much more endurance. We tracked this down to, we tracked this down to actually uh, the endothelial cells and the mice had better blood flow um, and CERT1 was actually the, the mechanism we, we um, were able to show. Also, mitochondria is, are going to be boosted. We're going to hear about mitochondria later. Um, but this was important because it showed that some aspects of aging, these are pretty old mice, could be reversed just in, a, in four weeks. And this gives us hope that in human studies we'll be able to see something like this, uh, either with the molecules we're developing or with the other molecules you'll hear about during uh, this conference. But now for the hard one. Uh, this is one of the things that drives me, has been driving me since I was about four years old. Uh, why don't we stay young? And it's such an obvious question, I don't think many of us even take, take this question seriously. Um, but if, if aliens were to come down and examine us as a species, they think we're kind of pathetic, uh, that we don't ask this question more often, and we have debates about how the heck are we ever going to help, help each other. Um, but yeah, what about why don't we stay young? Another way to put it is why do we age? Now, we, uh, thanks to, you know, Brian put out a beautiful uh, paper, which we all cite uh, all the time. Uh, this is a classic paper from a number of years ago, The Hallmarks of Aging. And, you know, eight or nine, depending on which continent you're on. And we all use this as a guideline to hopefully one day extend healthy lifespan. Um, I'm going to propose something um, because I think that it's worth discussing. With all of these, is there is there something upstream? Is there something that's that's driving many, if not all, of these processes. And so these are, these are nine dams on nine tributaries as a way to say maybe if we could go really upstream, maybe there's something we could really have a big effect on aging. And, and maybe even if we understood it well enough, we could truly reverse age, not just improve blood flow and, and that kind of thing that we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to propose that aging might if you boil it down to an equation or a process, it's a loss of information. So what do I mean by that? Um, so we're, we're born with two types of information that are essential for life. Without either, we'd be dead in about 10 seconds. One is the genome. Well, actually, we could probably do it without the genome for more than 10 seconds, but you couldn't do it without the epigenome for long. The epigenome, I think you all know, those of you who aren't uh, thinking about this all the time, the epigenome are the regulatory systems that regulate the genome. Um, originally, they were processes that allowed cells to develop uh, and inherit traits. Now, these days, we use it to also describe the packaging systems that either loop out DNA to be read as, it, as an active gene region or a, a bundle of DNA, uh, which is uh, essentially how you turn genes off on a large scale. And the, these green segments are histone proteins that have modifications. And modifications either on the DNA or the histones control what type of cell the cell is. Okay, there's a good reason why a nerve cell doesn't one day become a liver cell uh, and vice versa. That's because of the epigenome. And even though we have the same genome in most of our cells, uh, they behave very differently. But what I want to propose is the idea, first came from yeast, and I want to credit those in the Garinti lab that, that worked on this. We showed that in yeast cells, a major cause, cause of aging is a loss of gene expression, leading to the loss of cellular identity. And actually, it was Brian's first mutant, SIR 442, that showed that. Um, I think that the same process happens in our bodies, that our bodies, our cells are losing their ability to read the genome. The genome is still largely intact. When we're old, we still have that in genetic information. To be young again, we know we can clone animals and restore a whole lifespan from a somatic adult cell. So why couldn't we do something like this in, in our existing bodies? Uh, another way to talk about this is you can see this is a, a representation of a nucleus and on the left is a young cell that's transcribing the right genes to be functional, but over time, due to epigenetic disturbances, the most potent of which that we've discovered is the double-strand DNA break or a break to the chromosome. Those chromosomal breaks cause large disruptions to the epigenome, and over time, in the way that a, a package or a 
present is unwrapped. If you try to re-gift it once, that's fine, but try to open and repackage that, re-gift it a million times, it's not going to be that uh, pretty. And that's what we think is happening to, to the epigenome in, in the nucleus. Um, another way I describe this to uh, students when I teach them is that this is like a, a CD that gets scratched. And so the CD, I remind them, is a way we used to store music and photos. <laughs> and they go, wow, that's really cool. How many songs could you fit? Oh, about 10. That's great, guys. Um, anyway, so if, what's great about this analogy is if we're right about this, we should be able to polish that CD and get the symphony back again. Um, if we look at a different way to represent this, what I'm saying is that this pattern of gene expression for a young cell gets disrupted because proteins have to move to repair broken chromosomes, and they don't always find their way back again. And that leads to a loss of cellular identity, a loss of function, and cellular senescence. So what Richard talked about earlier uh, certainly is, is an endpoint to this process. And there's things like sub uh, subsenescence or presenescent cells that we're studying. So what happens if you do this in an animal? Well, we did this. We cut the chromosomes for a few weeks and disrupted their epigenome. Uh, and we asked the question, do, do they die? Do they get cancer? What happens? If we're right, they should have an accelerated epigenetic clock, which we can now measure using a pattern of chemicals on the DNA called DNA methylation. They should be older based on that measure. That's unbiased. But they should also develop diseases of aging, okay? Um, and then, so we just put a paper online, you can go see it, um, it's on Cell's uh, website called Sneak Peeks. They're under review, we have a couple of papers under review right now. And what we found was that by all measures, these mice were developing aging. You could call them symptoms of aging, same thing. Uh, and so essentially, we think we scratched the CD of these animals. And it's not just that they look old, if you go in, you measure the clock, um, if you look at the epigenome, they're actually they look like old mice. Um, you can actually turn this up or turn it down. These ones were cooked pretty well. Uh, we can accelerate aging pretty well. And we think that these mice might use, be useful as better models for, for diseases such as Alzheimer's than trying to study diseases in one-year-old mice um, and think that they represent an old human. Um, so this is not meant to be data to, to examine, but just an example of the kind of detail that we've gone into with these mice. Um, these are actually cells, in this case, that we've aged in vitro. We now have a system that ages cells, we think, um, and very reproducibly. And what we're seeing is a flattening of the epigenome. What I mean by that is that the peaks, those loops and those bundles that tell a cell what to be, uh, basically become flattened. And the, so the bundles unravel and the loops become more bundled and cells become a bland cell type or a melange of cells as we get older. Um, and that's what, what this data is indicating. But what about that clock? So this, this is work done with Vadim Gladyshev and with Steve Horvath, and who are two of the world's experts in this. The red, my, the red dots are the older mice that are 50% older based on the clock. Um, and on the left, there are actually enzymes that control this process. The, the enzymes that demethylate, remove these methyl chemicals that accumulate as we get older are called TETs. And we could ask the question, if we activate the TETs, what happens? Do we get Nothing? Does nothing happen? The clock goes back, but time doesn't change? Or does time actually go back? Um, in other words, can we reverse aging? And uh, we stood on the shoulders of uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte, uh, Yamanaka. We'll hear from Vittorio Sebastiano later today about his fantastic work on reprogramming cells to be younger again. Uh, we know of Yamanaka because he discovered um, the FAC4 genes that could take an adult cell to be young again. In, in fact, these factors called Yamanaka factors, or O, S, K, L, uh, and, uh, and M for short, these, these genes actually strip all, pretty much all the methyls off a cell and making it primordial. We don't want to do that. That would be the worst medicine of all. You turn someone into the world's giant, giant uh, largest tumor. But my student, um, Wan Cheng Lu, just decided to leave MYC off. So MYC is an oncogene. We don't want that in the, the animal. And by turning on just three of those Yamanaka factors, we're starting to see some true age reversal in parts of the mouse's body. Um, this is an example of reversal of retinal ganglial cells, the nerves at the back of the eye. We pinch the back of the optic nerve and it dies off. You can see with that, that orange color, um, it should actually extend all the way to the left. In fact, it's not because we've pinched it uh, on the right. And you can see we've lost a lot of the nerves, but if we turn on the reprogramming system, we preserve the nerves um, almost every nerve that gets the reprogramming survives. 
um, and then starts to grow back towards the brain. The longer we leave it, the further it grows back to the brain. We've done this now for glaucoma mice. They get uh, the vision back about 50%. And uh, the most remarkable finding was if we do this to an old mouse at one year of age, a black six mouse, it completely gets its vision back. Um, but how does this work? Well, we don't know everything about the clock, how it's working. We are pulling parts out. Uh, we've removed the tet, uh, two of the tets. And uh, this is an in vitro assay now. Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here. So that blue one is showing that nerves survive after vincristine damage, after reprogramming, but they don't work. This doesn't happen if you remove either TET1 or TET2. So we think that we are starting to see evidence that there are pieces of the clock. But where this information is re uh, residing, where's the backup hard drive of the epigenome, we don't know that yet, but we're looking hard for this. Um, so the proposal here is that perhaps the DNA methylation clock and the epigenome that controls it, it's not just a measure of our age, but it's a regulator of it, and it's reversible. Um, and we're probably going to, if it all goes well, start a clinical trial to reprogram the eye of patients with glaucoma in about two years. Um, and so I want to thank uh, the funding agencies and the people who made this work possible. Thank you.